This is 911. Do you have an emergency? Today on Rescue 911. It was too close for comfort. We didn't think the well, had much chance at all. An Australian community joins forces by land, air and sea to save a beached whale. We realised we are only going to get one chance. Watch as over 7,000 people pull together for the rescue. Then... i got a baby that's choking. She's choking on a sucker. A 911 operator is a panicked mother's only hope for her dying child. On Rescue 911. We begin along the north coast of Queensland, Australia, as tourists and local townsfolk were enjoying one of the area's magnificent beaches. Most of the footage in the story was taped as events unfolded, beginning on the afternoon of August 16th, 1991. That afternoon, lifeguard supervisor Scott Brady was patrolling Perigian Beach. I saw this whale cruising along 50 feet offshore, no more. A couple of small waves broke seaward of him and he just scraped his belly on the bottom and got washed into shore. Some people, the bystanders, were going there trying to rock the whale, rock him off the sandbar. It didn't work at all. Or, uh, and get sunburned from the, from the heat. We didn't think the whale had much chance at all. <laughs> I can suggest, folks, that everybody can get up around the head and hold the head into the water. Be careful down the tail because if it moves, it's harder it'll break you in half. My initial thoughts were this animal has very little chance. Chris Warner, the curator at Underwater World, was the first expert on the sea. We have a hot day, we have a tide that's going out, it's getting hot, it's getting burnt. He was in fairly serious danger of boiling in his own blubber unless something was done. Chris called in the marine rescue team from SeaWorld, led by rescue coordinator Trevor Long. By the time they arrived, a large crowd had gathered around the whale. I was concerned for these people because I don't think they realised the potential danger that they had themselves in. The weight of the animal was 30 tonne. <laughs> if the animal was to move its tail in a violent action, you've got four tonne of, of body mass that could break you or even kill you. Together, the experts assessed the whale's condition. These animals come up for usually only one reason, and they usually come up to die. But they determined that this whale was healthy and might survive if they could get it back into open water. We've done quite a lot of work with the humpbacks as far as research, but getting one off the beach is another, another kettle of fish. We decided that we'd have to tow the animal off the beach to free it from the beach, and the only way we were going to tow it was with a large vessel. Trevor put in a call then to SeaWorld to ask for our 60-foot rescue and research vessel to start making its way up to Perigian Beach. The animal was tending to be pushed aside onto the waves. If this happened, a large wave could have rolled the animal and submerged the blowhole, and of course it would have drowned if that was the case. SeaWorld trainer Kerry Haynes Lovell took over organising volunteers who worked through the night to keep the whale facing into the waves. We limited the shifts to 30 minutes. People get very emotionally involved when they're trying to rescue animals, and particularly this one, because he was so rare in occurrence, and they forget how cold they're getting, even with wetsuits. As volunteers fought to keep the whale alive, Trevor and Chris tried to design a sling that could pull the more than 30-ton mammal back out to sea. The sling had to be self-releasing because if the animal had a mind to, to, to go where it wanted to go, it could have quite easily have sunk the SeaWorld boat that was towing it. You're lucky to have these traps here, Chris. 
I had never had any experience regarding the movement of an animal of this size off the beach. I'd had a bit of experience in moving large sharks and I also have a background as an engineer. So I know a little bit about forces and lifting things and how to move things. If we've got to get someone to get it off, we can. You can cut off a hurry or something, yeah. yeah. That's a good idea, mate. Yes. The next morning, Trevor and Chris brought the sling to the beach. It was quite a depressing sight. And the animal was completely surrounded by sand. There was no water there. The situation had become more desperate. The whale was certainly in worse shape than it was when we'd first arrived there the day before. Its breathing had become extremely laboured. And almost seemed like it had given up the will to live. When we continue... We felt if we didn't get him off at that next midday tide, we would lose him. The heavy equipment that were there would be there to bury him, not to save him. It had been more than 18 hours since the humpback whale had become stranded on the shores in Queensland, Australia. Rescuers and volunteers were doing all they could to free the 35-ton animal, but time was running out. We started to dig around the animal with just shovels. We needed bigger equipment. We attempted to build a sand wall which would allow wave action to dig a natural channel out past the animal. It was a race against time. We need a change out there on the wild. We need a change out there. It was amazing to see thousands of people there helping that one whale and to think the fact that only a few years ago we were hunting these animals or hunting these whales in their thousands. You know, it's quite heartening. It's oh, just great. extraordinary. It's wonderful to see Australians rallying to do something for an animal that didn't even ask to be <laughs> One chap, he came up to me and he asked, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, more, more or less jokingly, I said, can you dig me a channel through the surf? And he said, I'll give it a good go. The next minute he was out there in the surf with his equipment trying to dig this channel through the surf. This is what these guys actually do for a living. This wasn't a hobby for them. These machines were their livelihood, and so if they drowned them, that was their livelihood. Gun. We felt if we didn't get him off at that next midday tide, we would lose him. That, unfortunately, the, the heavy equipment that were there would be there to bury him, not to save him. As the tide rose and the animal felt more water around its body, it started to become a little bit more active. It could have fought, it could have done a tremendous amount of damage to the people around it, and it could have jeopardised the whole operation, but it, it remained calm. I do think the animal knew that we were trying to help it. It was getting extremely dangerous. The waves were getting really strong. It was very dangerous for our boat as well. It was sitting out behind the breakers and I can tell you I was glad I wasn't out there because it was rocking and rolling. There was a window of opportunity that would allow us to free the animal from the beach, but it was only a very small time frame. We realised we were only going to get one chance. We had to go down and get these loops over the animal's petrol fins. The current was that strong, it was actually pulling the mask off my face underwater. It was a hell of a difficult job. Putting the loops over the petrol fins is probably like putting a tight pair of jeans on while you're standing in a crowded moving bus. We all joined hands just to stop the slings from being washed away because our feet were being washed away from underneath us.
you're very anxious, you're emotional, you're keyed up. You've got people in the water holding the animal still. You've got another group of people which are holding the sling. If this operation didn't work the first time, the animal was going to die. Can you hear me, C-1-1? C-1-1! I remember being down under the water, waiting for the boat to take up the slack on the rope. It seemed like an eternity until the rope actually came tight. into words what I felt at that time. I found tears in my eyes and I suppose there was, a, there was another part of me that was saying geez you can't stand and cry here on the beach in front of all these people but that's what I felt like. Actually I felt like going down on my knees. When 7,000 people cheer you have to be moved by it. I looked around I saw Trevor he had tears in his eyes I had tears in my eyes I turned away we had a minister for environment he turned around I was looking straight at him he's crying he runs up and hugs me. You feel like running around and hugging 7,000 people. Once he got out there, he just took off. He swam past the boat. He just swam out of the sling and said, see you later, guys, thanks very much. I'll see you next year. Months have passed. All the people who helped out that day are proud of what they worked together to accomplish. I don't believe that anywhere in the world there was an animal of this size and of this weight and this species which had ever been rescued before. It was a first. Oh, that was good splash. That was good. It was extremely rewarding just to be a part of it. Come on, Splash. That's a girl, Splash. Good girl. Good. I don't want to see a whale stranded. I don't want to see any animal in distress. But to have that feeling again of, of succeeding with a whole group of people is just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Everybody was a hero that day. It was the job well done. We'd all accomplished what we'd set out to do. We'd save our humpback whale. As humans, we're always mucking up this planet. It was a small thing we could do to undo the damage that, that mankind in general has done. If, if this attitude can be developed, not just towards whales, but to all animals, we might just reverse a few of these trends towards the destruction of the planet. Next. There's not a feeling in the world to describe the terror that I was feeling. I thought I was going to lose her that day for sure. Most of us would do anything to protect the people we care about most. But on the afternoon of June 5, 1992, at her home in Indianapolis, Indiana, Lisa Smith found out that love is not always enough to keep them safe. I babysit for Mindy and Melanie during the week. And on this particular day, I have my four children and the babies. After they got done with lunch, I brought the two babies in the house and sent the older kids on out to play. Who's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. The Grover. Where? I don't see no dog. Mindy said that she had to potty. Go potty? We started potty training about two or three months, and as a reward, I always, you know, gave Mindy a sucker. Good girl. Look what you get for going on the potty. Yeah, sucker. Let's get sissy one. It's good. Here, sit down here. Let's do this. Okay. Yeah. Here we go, sweetie.
at Indianapolis Fire and EMS. Yes, yes, I got a baby that's choking. She's choking on the sucker. She's okay, okay ma'am, calm down. What is your address? 308 North. Is that a house or an apartment? It's a, it's a, it's a double. It's a double? Yes. Okay, is the baby still conscious? Yes, I, she's choking. She's choking. Okay, ma'am. Okay, hold on the phone. I'm going to dispatch somebody. Carol Wash had been an Indianapolis Fire EMS dispatcher for three years. My insides were just going crazy. You have four to six minutes to do what you're going to do. And after that, it's real touchy. What do I do? I'm going to tell you. Let me get someone dispatched and on the way, okay? okay? Stay on the phone. I had to tell her to hang on for a second while I got the units going. And I felt bad about that, but I thought, at least I've got help on the way in case I can't help her. Medic 2, rescue engine 12, the child choking, 1412. Location 5000 East, freezer right north. How is she breathing? Is she breathing normally? Just, no, she's, she's just dead. She's choking. Okay, what calm down, do? calm down. Is she turning blue or anything? Yes. Okay, she's not able to cry or anything? No. Okay. There's not a feeling in the world to describe the terror that I was feeling. I felt like it was my fault. I love her like she was just my own. And uh, I thought I was going to lose her that day for sure. It was the first time I was going to have to use the emergency medical dispatch cards, so I was nervous. Okay, what do you think she's choking on? A sucker. A sucker? A sucker, yes, yeah, she bit into a baby sucker. Okay. Okay, I'm going to tell you what to do for the baby, okay? Is she right there with you? Yes. Okay, remove the clothing from the baby's chest. Okay. Okay, pick her up. Yes. Turn the baby face down. Yes. So she's lying along your forearm. Is yes, she got it. small enough for that? Yes. Support her jaw in your hand. Uh-huh. Okay, the bottom should be held between your elbow and hip. Uh -huh. It's real nerve-wracking not to be able to see the person who's in trouble. You just have to take someone's word for it over the phone. And that's, that's scary and dangerous. Okay, now you've got all that? You've got her in that yes. position? Yes. Okay, tilt the baby with the head down slightly. Uh -huh. Use the heel of your hand uh -huh. to strike her back four times, right between the shoulder blades. Oh, there it comes. Oh, God, there comes the sucker. Oh, God. On the fourth thrust, the sucker just flew out of her mouth. I was just so elated that she was, she was alive, you know. She's not choking no more. She's not choking? Did the sucker come up? Yes. Great, great. How is she doing now? Is she crying? She's just, she's just real dazed. Is she getting any air? Can you see her chest yes. rising? Yes. Okay, oh great. All right, just lay the baby down. The Keep her real here. still. The ambulance is here. Okay, ma'am, great. Okay. Uh-huh, bye-bye. I'd never saved anyone over the phone, so it was a new experience for me. And I sat back in my chair, and then I looked around the room, and I said, I just had a save. Within three minutes of the call, the Indianapolis Fire Rescue Unit was on the scene, led by Mark Oster. When we arrived, I had one of the firefighters check out the baby, and there was no visible injury. Yes, turned all blue. She started to cry quite loudly, so we knew everything was completely fine with the baby at that point. <laughs> the sucker had become lodged in Mindy's throat when the stick it was on broke. I had no idea that a sucker could be so dangerous after this experience. I don't allow them in my house. I don't allow my older children to have suckers, period. I already knew CPR, but I didn't know the Heimlich maneuver for infants. I think that's something that every babysitter, every mother in the world should know. The Cox family is thankful for Lisa Smith's action that day. I think she did great. And to tell you the truth, I think she's the only babysitter we had in a long time that I trust. If it wasn't for the 911 system and Carol Walsh, Mindy would not be here today. I love Mindy to death. She's the sweetest little girl. And just to see her up running around and playing and normal every day, it's a wonderful feeling. Give me a kiss, Mindy. Give me a kiss.